Trinity West Seattle family. It is great to be with you this Sunday morning. I am super excited to get to worship with you guys today because we're doing something different. We actually have a special service planned and we are going to be celebrating the story of Pentecost. Now to some of you that might sound like a scary word, but it is not. Um, it's actually a beautiful story that we see in the book of Acts. And it's where Jesus has left his disciples and the gift of the Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity, is given to the disciples. And so Pastor Joel has a special sermon prepared and we're actually going to be singing some songs that celebrate the work of the Spirit in the lives of believers and it's going to be a great time. Anyhow, um, this week has been another trying week for humanity, not just because of the pandemic, but because we have seen, if you turn on your TVs, we've seen the evil that resides in the heart of man on full display. And so I've been trying to process um, how I'm supposed to respond as follower of Jesus, as someone uh, where the Spirit of God resides. How do I respond when I see a man unjustly murdered? Well, I do believe that the gospel comes to redeem, right? To save. But it also comes to restore and it comes to uh, make life flourish. And I think that as the hands and feet of Jesus, the church is called not just to proclaim the gospel in word, but we are actually called to seek justice and to speak out and act on behalf of the oppressed. So I would encourage you with that today, um, that you would seek the face of God, that we would be a people that are fearless in seeking justice in this world. Now we know that God is in control of all things, and so we go before him this day, and we beg that he would guide us and lead us. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14, it says, Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Let us worship him this day. All right, church, let's sing out.
history unfolds Hope is assured Because God is with us in our world Days are secure Even now as history unfolds Hope is assured That we can sing Let every tongue So we worship a God who rules and reigns over all creation. He is on his throne right now, yet he reigns with a loving hand. Uh, we are a people who continue to put our hands up to him. We continue to want to grab hold of our lives. We continue to walk away from his truth, yet he lovingly brings us back. He extends mercy to us, and we continue to need to repent for our ways. I'm going to hand this over to my buddy Yaro, who serves on the worship and production team, and he's going to lead us in a prayer of confession together. Hi, church. My name is Yaro, and I serve on the worship and production team. And I would like to invite you all to read this confession with me. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen.
Hi, church. My name is Frazier. This is my wife, Holly. This is our daughter, Pearl. And this is our son, who's going to come out and meet us in just two months. I'm a deacon in training at Trinity, and both my wife and I work at a ministry called Children of the Nations. We work with orphaned and destitute children in Africa and the Caribbean, helping them rise up to become the next generation of leaders in their countries. This week, we're celebrating Pentecost, the descent of the Holy Spirit on the disciples of Jesus after his ascension. And I'm going to read Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 12 through 14. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord, when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you will come to life, and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it declares the Lord. These verses are a beautiful picture of what God has done. He has pulled us up out of our graves, regenerating our hearts and souls, and giving us a new identity and life that is empowered in his spirit. This is Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 28. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup, and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Hear this, church, regarding your position to God. Once you were dead in your sin, but Christ has come and has made a way to have a relationship with our Creator. Now you can take communion at our home. We usually take turns because we have our sweet daughter with us pour a little wine or juice into a little cup and just take some bread and break off a few pieces of bread. Let me pray for us. Dear Lord, thank you so much for sending your son to make a way for us to have a relationship with you, to be in right standing, to have our sins forgiven. Um, we're so grateful for that. And <sighs> can't imagine um, what life would be like without that. We're grateful for you, Lord, and the ability to take communion every week. Amen. I'm happy. All right, church, so I'm going to introduce a new song to you guys. This is a song that I wrote with a buddy of mine, and it's called Spirit of Our God, and it's focusing on the Holy Spirit. And so um, there's a line in here uh, that says, Our Father in Heaven is revealing what He's done. What has He done? Um, well, if the Spirit lives with us and in us as believers, then it is the Spirit that is illuminating Scripture, that is leading us, that is convicting us, um, and is actually revealing God's very purpose for us as believers. And so that's what that line means. Uh, it's a pretty simple song, and so let's sing it together.
Pastor David here to share our call to give. Today, we celebrate the birth of the church when the promised Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. Jesus said to his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. As God the Father and the Son graciously sent the Holy Spirit to birth the church, this same Holy Spirit empowers us today to be a generous people in the sharing of our gifts and our time and our finances. We are supposed to be a people marked by generosity. And we express this generosity tangibly by the giving of our tithes to the local church and the serving of the needs of our community. There are several ways that you can give to the ongoing work of God in and through Trinity. You can either mail in your check, you can give online, or you can give through your mobile devices. Some of you may be struggling financially and you need the help of the church family to come alongside of you. Please, please contact us so that we can, we can pray together and also explore ways that we can help you in your situation. At this time, I will turn it over to Marie. Good morning, Trinity. As Pastor Joel leads us in the meaning and significance around the celebration of the Pentecost, I thought that it was appropriate for us to take this passing of the peace and not only greet one another within our congregation, but also pause, take that deep breath, and think of who the Holy Spirit is placing on your heart right now. As always, use this hashtag on social media so that the congregation can greet one another and we can feel that much closer together. We've been blessed with the Holy Spirit to go forth and share the gospel and that starts first by reaching out. So let's do that now. Have a blessed Sunday. Hello, Trinity West Seattle. My name is Pastor Joel, and I'm grateful that I get to share God's Word with you again today. And we are not going to be continuing in our series called Great Affliction, Greater Kingdom. We'll pick that back up next week. Today, we are celebrating Pentecost. And why did I want to do this today? Why did I want to celebrate Pentecost? Well, because as human beings, we are formed through the stories that we tell and the stories that we remember. And we remember our history as the church through placing ourselves in these stories, just like we do at Christmas. We remember Jesus's birth, just like we do on Good Friday. We remember Jesus's death. And, and all of these things can actually shape our lives and our hearts to become more God-shaped, formed by God as we recount what God has done. But I also wanted to celebrate it because without Pentecost, there's no church. We literally wouldn't be here. Uh, without Pentecost, there are all these unfulfilled prophecies from the Old Testament about the Messiah and what would happen through the Holy Spirit coming after Him. And uh, without those things, we don't exist. Uh, without these things, the gospel wouldn't have come to us, especially those of us who are Gentiles. And so um, it's a tremendously important time and holiday for us as Christians. But also, if you're not a Christian, and if you're not a Christian, just want to say really glad that you're joining us and uh, glad that you're here uh, virtually <laughs> anyway. And we all long for connection to God. And so our hope, my hope, is that you would experience the gift of God being present with you and that that is actually made possible through His sending of His Holy Spirit, which happened on Pentecost. So that's why we're celebrating this today. And the big idea today is really because God has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit, we should repent, believe, and bear witness. Bear witness really about Jesus Christ as Lord. And so 
We're going to be in the book of Acts today. We'll kind of jump around quite a bit. And as someone reads the text to us, I want you to think of Acts as a continuation or a sequel to the Gospel of Luke. Luke wrote both books, and the Gospel was about what Jesus began to do. Acts is about what Jesus continued to do through the sending of His Spirit and through the work of the Apostles. And so have that in mind as we go about this story. So we're going to have someone read the text for us, then I'll pray, and we'll get started. Hello, Trinity. We're the Davies family. My name is Luke. This is my wife, Laura. Hi. My daughter, our daughters, Josie and Hattie. <laughs> Please stand for the reading of God's Word. Today's scripture is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 22 through 24, and then 36 through 41. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man clearly attested to you by God with powerful deeds, wonders, and miraculous signs that God performed among you through him, just as you yourselves know. This man, who was handed over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you executed by nailing him to a cross at the hands of Gentiles. But God raised him up, having released him from the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held in its power. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know, beyond a doubt, that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were acutely distressed and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, What should we do, brothers? Peter said to them, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. With many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this perverse generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added. This is God's word. Please be seated. Join me as I pray for us and our time in God's word. Thank you, God, for speaking to us. Thank you that you have given birth to your church. Thank you that you have uh, given us the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news about him, so that we can know and so that we can receive and we can believe, but we can also be filled with your Holy Spirit to be your witnesses. And we pray that that would happen, that as we recount this story, that we would uh, be lit up with the fire of the Holy Spirit in our own lives and hearts that we might share the good news about Jesus as well. Uh, but also for those of us who don't know you yet, God, I pray that each one of the, those people watching or listening would come to the place of repentance, that they would turn away from their life of sin and turn to you in total surrender and trust as their Lord. And Jesus, we know that that can't happen apart from your Holy Spirit. We can't understand the Scripture apart from your Holy Spirit. So we thank you for sending him, and we invite you, Spirit, to come and speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we get into the story of Pentecost, I wanted to first lay some groundwork for us. As I said earlier, we're shaped by uh, stories, and God forms us as we see ourselves inside of those stories. And so I want you to picture yourself, if you will, as the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost, okay? Pretty much all of Jesus' early followers were Jews, and as a good Jew, you, that's Peter, that's you, <laughs> you've celebrated this holiday, Pentecost, with your family for your whole life. It, it was one of many holidays that you would have celebrated with them. Uh, you would have come into Jerusalem throughout the year. You would have been there for the Passover, where you remember God's salvation from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. And just like they did on that first Passover night, you and your family and everyone would have slaughtered a lamb, signifying that you belong to God and His wrath has passed over you. But 50 days after Passover, you would have returned to Jerusalem for the first of several harvest festivals. And the first one is 
Pentecost. 50, it comes from the Greek word 50th day, I think something like that. And you were there to recall the story as it continued. It didn't end on the night of Passover. It, it continued on. And as Israel had been freed from slavery in Egypt, they left and they passed through the waters of the Red Sea where God defeated Pharaoh and his army. But for the next 50 days, they wandered in the wilderness until they came to Mount Sinai. On day number 50, Moses went up into the mountain and he received from God the words of the Ten Commandments, which were written on stone. And this, this was God's way, really, the, of giving his law, of saying, I redeemed you, uh, you belong to me, and here is how you are to live as my people. And as a Jew, uh, that was actually what you celebrated on Pentecost. That, that was what you came there to commemorate. But you did so through this harvest and remembering in, uh, who God is and the law that he's given to you in the time of the harvest. So you bring your first fruits of your first harvest, perhaps bales of wheat, something like that. And this is all done in remembrance of what happened on that 50th day in the giving of God's law. So remember, you're putting yourself in the shoes of Peter, you're this first century Jew, and this year is different than any other year before it. This Pentecost is special because earlier this year, on the Passover feast, during the Passover feast, Jesus was crucified on the cross. This Jesus who you followed and worshipped and spent the last three plus years of your life with was crucified. And what you recognize is that there's a new exodus that has begun. This isn't like that old exodus exactly, the one that happened to the nation of Israel. This is a new exodus that, that God, just as God passed over the houses of those who had slaughtered a lamb in Israel, or sorry, in Egypt, uh, Jesus is our Passover lamb whose blood covers, and div covers us and diverts the wrath of God from us. But he's also risen from death. And so just as God defeated Pharaoh and his army and, and really their enemies in Israel, uh, Jesus has liberated us from our enemies of Satan, sin, and death. And for the next 40 days, remember Peter, this, this year here, for the next 40 days after that Passover, Jesus had appeared to you and to hundreds of other people at a time. And all of this culminated in you and your fellow apostles coming together with Jesus and asking him this question, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> to which he answered, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. So you're hearing this and you're thinking, man, all these prophecies from the Old Testament have come to pass in Jesus. But if he's the Messiah, then it's time to get this whole kingdom thing, this, this show on the road. It's time to get this thing rolling. Uh, but Jesus says to you, you don't get to know exactly when I will complete and fulfill all the rest of these promises about my kingdom. You don't get to know when my kingdom will be fully realized, but here's what you do get to know. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so Jesus is telling you, your kingdom vision, Peter, your kingdom vision, apostles, is too small. You think I'm here to restore the kingdom to Israel? No, God's kingdom is going to go to the entire end of the earth. And the way that's going to happen is for you to receive the promised Holy Spirit and for you to become my witnesses. And what do witnesses do? They testify. You are going to testify by the power of the Holy Spirit. The thing that's kind of crazy, though, is that this is the last 
thing that Jesus physically says while on earth. Immediately afterward, he ascends into heaven. And so you're standing there with your fellow apostles with probably your jaws on the ground, kind of staring up into the sky when you notice these angels, two angels around you. And they tell you, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So in a way they're saying, don't worry about it, guys. Jesus is coming back. And yet, you still don't know what to do. What, what are you going to do? And you think back to what Jesus had just promised you, in captured in chapter 1, verse 8, that we just saw. You wait. You wait. You begin to wait. You're waiting to do what Jesus said, to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And that brings us to the first Christian Pentecost. It's exactly 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, which was the conclusion of Passover, remember. And you're waiting, along with the entire church at that time, around 120 people. Now, if you understood that you were going through this new exodus, you may have seen it coming. You may have seen this pass, uh, this Pentecost coming. You may have been thinking to yourself, in the old exodus, they were given God's law on the 50th day, but in the new exodus, what's God going to do? Now, if you ran through prophecies in the Old Testament, your minds would have remembered God promising that instead of giving His people a new law, he would give them a new heart. God's way, not written on tablets of stone, but written on human hearts, along with the power of the Holy Spirit to guide you. And so if you're Peter, I'm not sure whether or not you had this in mind, whether or not you recognized this, this new exodus that you were going through. But if you had been, you would be ready for that Pentecost. You'd be anticipating it, expecting it. You would see that something new was about to happen, that, that, that the harvest was about to be celebrated. And it wasn't going to be celebrated in bales of wheat. The harvest was going to be in human souls. You know something incredible is about to happen. You don't know when. You don't know how. And so you wait. And then suddenly, this story shifts when a sound came from the sky. So we're going to step outside of the story now. You're no longer Peter. And we're going to read the rest of the story kind of from a third-person perspective. The story shifts when a sound came from the sky like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. I picture that kind of like being on each person's head, almost like this symbol of fire, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. Those are other languages. As the Spirit gave them utterance, as, as the Holy Spirit allowed them to. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. That's all people groups. And at this, at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Now you got to understand, Galileans were like the lowest on the totem pole. These guys are out, they're from the sticks, you know, they're, they're pretty uh, blue collar, low-class citizens. They're going, hold on, who are these guys? How do they know all these other languages? Verse 8, and how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes, these are all nations that are going to get uh, named here. Parthians and Medes, 
Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Those are people who've converted to Judaism. Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. No, I'm not drinking wine. Here's where I need to just pause in the storytelling for a second, okay? Because if you've been a part of the church for a while, then you've probably encountered differing views on this passage that I just read. But let's start by simply seeing what is written here in the text. Let's just kind of look at the text, try and set aside all those other viewpoints and things that you've heard or learned in the past. Now, we don't have time to go into every detail, of course, in this, but don't miss the main point of the passage. What's the main point? The promise of the Holy Spirit has come. The Holy Spirit was promised, and now He is here. And this is how He was sent at a time when people from every nation on earth were present, different ethnicities, different uh, languages, different cultures from Africa, Asia, modern day Europe and the Middle East. They've, they've all come together in this one place. And mind you, these, these were all people who already believed in the God of the Bible. They knew the prophecies about the Messiah. They'd come to town, actually, to celebrate Pentecost, but they had no idea what they were actually in for this year, did they? And all who were present there on that day got to hear about the mighty works of God. That's the gospel. That's the story of Jesus and what He did. And they got to hear it in their own languages. People who otherwise wouldn't have spoken these languages now all of a sudden were enabled to. And it was by a miracle of the Holy Spirit. They could now speak the gospel as though they were native speakers of these different languages. Why? Because this is the beginning of the fulfillment of Jesus' promise that the gospel would go to the ends of the earth. God is doing what He said He would, and the church is officially born. By the way, isn't it lovely that our church is right next uh, to the fire station? So you get to hear things like that interrupting my sermon. Well, let's come back to, the, to what I was talking about. So, so what's happening? God is doing what He said He would, and the church is born. And while what th that reality is incredible, there are actually differing responses to it. There's some who are amazed and perplexed, and they're going, what? what's happening here. And there's a whole other group who are saying, these guys are drunk. <laughs> and, and so today, just like on that first Christian Pentecost, there is much confusion, and I would say even division over the Holy Spirit and His work in the Christian life. I, sadly and ironically, the Holy Spirit was given for unity, and, and yet, to this day, the issue of the Spirit is one of the greatest causes for division in the church. I actually heard a pastor who was asked this question, if Jesus returned today, what would he be most angry about? And the pastor said, the disunity and division in the church. And I think in many ways he's right. But instead of dividing over our beliefs about the Holy Spirit, we should come back to the heart of what this passage reveals, that the Holy Spirit has been given first and foremost to empower the message of Jesus to transform lives, plain and simple. And Peter shows that this is true by proceeding to preach. This is really even the pattern in all of the book of Acts. There's the Holy Spirit being given the, the proclamation of God's Word, and then the response to it. And so, 
Peter now does so in response to the apparent confusion over what was going on with these people as, as everyone was speaking in tongues in different languages. Now, does Peter preach in Greek or in Aramaic, or do they set up little translating stations with all these people at each one or something like that so that everyone could understand? We're not told. We, we don't know. Uh, and apparently we're not told because it doesn't really matter that much. <laughs> but what matters is what Peter is about to say. That's what matters. What he preaches can be summed up in two parts. First, he explains that this is the fulfillment of the Old Testament promise of the Holy Spirit. And second, he preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ as a way of explaining why all of this is happening. And so, here's what Peter says. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. Now, that's 9 a.m. And so, while it's less likely that they would be drunk, sadly, this is not necessarily the best proof for why they're not drunk, as we all know. Uh, but anyway, that's beside the point. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and my female servants in those days I will pour out my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes." the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so we are awaiting that future day where some of this really crazy, intense stuff starts to happen. But what Peter is, is saying is that the Holy Spirit has come. The Holy Spirit has come. And think about this. Peter, who's a man who only 50 days prior was a total wimp, he was denying Jesus and trying to save his own skin, here has now been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit so that he boldly gets up in front of a crowd of thousands of people to preach. And he's explaining that this is, this is God doing what he said that he would. These people aren't speaking out of drunkenness, but because the Spirit is being poured out literally like anointing oil. The Spirit is being poured out on not just these people, but on all flesh, it said, all humankind, people from all over the world. Now think about the significance of this. Now place yourself in that crowd. These people who were present from every nation on earth, as it said earlier, they may have believed in the Jewish God, but they weren't allowed to worship Him in the same way as the Jews. They were confined to the court of the Gentiles at the temple. They were, uh, in some sense, prevented from experiencing the fullness of the presence of God. They were privileged, yes, to know Him at all, but at the same time there was still this, this divide, not just between them and God, but even between them and other people groups, other nations, other ethnicities. And so I want to point out here that a huge part of what God accomplished on that day was beginning, unite, beginning to unite all peoples to Himself. The Bible says that God's plan before time was to reconcile people of every culture and every ethnicity under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's what the church is. And I couldn't help but think about that truth this week as I mourned the loss of, of George Floyd and his death and, and really all that surrounds it. As human beings, but especially as the church, it should break our hearts. It should grieve us to the core 
that such a climate exists in our country where not only is there violence, but there's a disproportionate amount of injustice and violence against racial minorities. And so part of our calling as Christians is to partner with God, the Holy Spirit, to create culture that doesn't divide, but unites. We want to be ministers of reconciliation. We want to be people of peace, even across racial barriers. And so coming back to our story, God is uniting all peoples under the Lordship of Jesus. So again, we want to be the church uh, that reflects that reality, that truth. And the coming of the Holy Spirit is this explosive leap forward in that process. But remember, Peter doesn't only explain that this is a fulfillment of the promise of the Holy Spirit. He also explains that the Holy Spirit has come because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's what he says, men of Israel, and he's speaking to all people of Israel, men and women of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So Peter tells them that he tells them about Jesus because the Holy Spirit is being poured out due to what Jesus has done. And here's Peter's gospel. Jesus is a man who did mighty works. He did wonders. He did signs that proved that he was sent by God. Things like healing others, casting out demons, raising people from death. All kinds of incredible signs and wonders. And again, he's proved that he was sent by God. But instead of accepting him, Peter tells this crowd, you did exactly what God knew you would do. You acted unjustly and crucified and killed him. But because God planned for this, Jesus didn't stay dead, but was risen. And now death is dead. Death is dead because of what Jesus has done. And, and what's the significance of this? Well, it proves that he is both Lord and Christ, meaning Jesus of Nazareth is both the Lord of the universe, which is really a, a title reserved only for God. So he's saying Jesus is God, but he's also the Messiah, the King of the Jews, and the, now the King of the whole world. Boom! This is, a, this is a mic drop moment for Peter as he shares this truth. And at the same time, this crowd has been indicted. This crowd have been sh they've, they've been shown to have participated in the death of God. They've been declared guilty as charged, but they've also been shown that in spite of all of this, everything is different. That Jesus still lives on. Jesus rose and Jesus reigns. And friends, we are in that crowd. We're in that crowd with them together. We are all participants in the death of Jesus because he died for our sins. We've been indicted. We've been declared guilty as charged. We're in that crowd. And this is a powerful message that that I hope you are hearing by the power of the Holy Spirit in spite of my weaknesses, my limitations as a preacher, and this video screen that's standing between us right now. And I pray that we would all also come to the same place that the crowd came to on that day. Here's what happened. Here's their response. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? 
And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, that's the promise of the Spirit, is for you and for all your children and to all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. 3,000 souls. Imagine that. That's that's 3,000 men, because that's how they counted back then. So that doesn't include women and children. This could have been well over 5,000 thousand people were brought into the church that one day. And as I said earlier, the Holy Spirit coming and the birth of the church is explosive. And this is their response to the Holy Spirit coming to this, this new Pentecost, to the preaching of the gospel with power. They were cut to the heart, as it said. They knew they had to do something, but they weren't sure what that was. And so they asked, and the gospel cuts to our hearts as well. And as it does, we must respond. We can't just sit neat and tidy and comfortable in our living rooms, as I'm guessing you're receiving this right now. No, we have to go through the discomfort, maybe it's from your living room, of reckoning our own souls to God. And the answer that was given to them in response to their question is the same answer that is given to us. Repent and be baptized. Repent. Repentance is a turning away from a life of bondage to sin and turning to a life that is found in God and Him alone. It's, it's forsaking everything in your life that can't remain under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But you don't just repent. You also uh, receive the forgiveness of your sins, the sins that Jesus died for. And then along with that, you receive the gift of His Holy Spirit in your life to guide you. And you do that as you identify yourself with Jesus through Baptism. So baptism not only identifies us with Jesus, it reveals a spiritual reality that, that our old self has died with him as we've repented of sin. And our new self has been raised with him. And we know that we are truly alive when we are found in him. And so this invitation is open to every person, no matter your history, your social class, your ethnicity, your culture. You are invited to repent and be baptized. But you might be going, well, okay, but how am I going to do that? I mean, I'm watching this video on my sofa and we're on lockdown right now. What do you want me to do? Walk down the hall and, you know, draw up a bath and dunk myself? No, 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 you don't have to do that. It's a legit question, though, okay? Uh, as we mentioned earlier in our service, we want to connect with you, especially if, that, if you're hearing the call of God on your life to be baptized. Maybe you've, you've been a Christian for a while, you've never been baptized. Maybe you're hearing the call on, of God on your life right now for the very first time. I want to encourage you, answer that call. Repent believe and be baptized. And so we want you to connect with us. And man, do I wish that we could do that in person. Do I wish that we weren't uh, doing this over video, but being what it is, we want to ask you to connect with us through phone or through email. I'm going to put those contact uh, avenues up right now. Reach out to us. We would love to celebrate the new life that you have been given in Christ with you. And, you know, I'm, we'll deal with whatever we need to in order to get baptisms going. I'm not sure what that is yet. We'll figure it out. And we'll make sure it's safe. We'll bring the hand sanitizer and all that kind of stuff, okay? So let's connect and let's follow up on that. Now, if you are a Christian, 
If you've already been baptized as a Christian, then you've been filled with the Holy Spirit and and you've been given the Holy Spirit not only to unite you with God and with His people, the church, but the Holy Spirit now brings the power of God into your life so that you're able to live as He has commanded us, right? The, The new a heart, the new desires, the Holy Spirit being given to us, as we talked about earlier. And and the Holy Spirit has also been given to you so that you have the power to bear witness about Jesus Christ. You have the power now to share the good news about Jesus with others and tell them about Him. Tell... Uh, tell your friends, your family, your co-workers, your neighbors, your, your relatives, your children about Jesus and what He has done and what He is doing. That is what you're being invited to today. Let me pray and we'll respond to God together now. Heavenly Father, it's so amazing to hear this story of the birth of the church. It's, it's almost unbelievable. It just sounds so incredible. And we wish that we could be there, but we thank you for putting us inside of this story today so that we could experience it for ourselves to some extent. And we pray, God, we would be people who respond just like these people responded. Help us to not only repent, but to believe and to to live transformed lives that testify about who Jesus is and what He has done. Help us now, Holy Spirit, to also respond to You in joy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to respond in two different ways right now. One that we don't normally do and another that we do normally do, which is sing. So we'll get to the singing in a second. But first, I want to invite you to read a confession of faith that Christians throughout the centuries have done for since the third century uh, have read this creed. And this is a way of testifying to Jesus. This is a way of confessing Christ. This is a way of repenting and believing. And so read this creed with me in your home out loud, and then we will respond in song. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, church, now let's respond in song. Thank you so much for that word, Pastor Joel. It was refreshing. It was good for us to hear. And church, as we leave this virtual space, hear this word. I need to hear this. The Spirit of God indwells you. He indwells me. I pray that we would live in that power today and this week and the rest of our lives. I pray that we would be a people that are fearless in proclaiming the good news of the gospel, that we would seek justice, that we would proclaim truth, and that we would love those around us. God, set our hearts ablaze. Let's sing this right now.
Good morning to our friends and family at Trinity West Seattle. This is my wife Peggy and I'm Ray, and we're the Gorums. Today it's our privilege and honor to be able to bring to you the benediction found in Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And we pray that we have a blessed week, knowing that we have abundant hope through Christ Jesus our Lord. See you, Trinity. Love you all.